Hi, I'm Simpson Garfinkel. I'm the Senior Computer Scientist for Confidentiality and Data Access at the US Census Bureau. I'm going to talk today about our work using Spark and differential privacy to protect the privacy of the 2020 census respondents. Uh, this uh, is a pre official presentation, but the views that are in this presentation are mine, those of the author, and those not of the US Census Bureau. And um, this abstract is here so that Google will be able to find and index this talk. This is uh, the work of a large team at the US Census Bureau. The team is headed by John About, the chief scientist. Dan Kiefer, the scientific lead, came up with a top-down algorithm. Uh, and we have a team with uh, many people on it. So the outline is I'm going to first talk about the motivation. Uh, the, behind uh, our use of Spark and differential privacy. Then I'm going to talk about how we're using differential privacy in the 2020 census. I'm gonna talk about the top-down algorithm. And then I'm gonna talk about the work that we've done monitoring Spark. Um, and this is largely a homegrown system. And I'll say that if anybody in the audience can think of a better way of doing this, please contact me because we are actively looking for additional ideas. So the census is called for in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 2 uh, calls for Congress to make an actual enumeration of the people of the United States every 10 years. And that information is used to apportion the House of Representatives. It's also used to distribute um, uh, $675 billion in 2015 and presumably more today in federal funds. And it's also used by the Department of Justice for enforcing the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965. And um, so it, it's very, very important. Uh, also the decennial census is used to calibrate the American Community Survey and, and many other projects that we have at the Census Bureau. It is the reference frame. So for the decennial census and for all data products that the US Census Bureau puts out, we also have to follow strict confidentiality requirements as specified in law in Title 13, Section 9 of the US Code, which is uh, Title 13 is the Census Act. And Section 9 says that we cannot make any publication that reveals the data provided by a person or an establishment. So one way of thinking about this is that we can't make any publication so that you can draw a line from the person or the establishment that provided the data to the data publication. And um, uh, we, uh, Census Bureau employees, are sworn for life to protect that respondent data. <clears throat> and the data can't be used for non statistical purposes, which means it cannot be, we cannot do special reveal our confidential data for law enforcement or immigration or anything like that. Now, for the 2010 census, we collected data on 308,745,538 people in the United States. And for each one, we collected where they lived, the household they were in, their sex, their age, their race, their ethnicity, and their relationship to that householder. Uh, so you could be the householder, you could be the householder's spouse, you could be their child, their parent, you could be an unrelated person living with the householder. It comes to about 44 bits of data per person. And so the entire 2010 census, the raw confidential data is 1.7 gigabytes, which doesn't really seem like that much data. In fact, uh, if you think about it in terms of integers, we basically collected six integers per person. <clears throat> but we publish that data in many different ways. We we collect it, to, we summarize it, we tabulate it, we um, put out publications that say the number of people living on a block, the number of people of each race living on a block. We publish age pyramids at the census tract level. In total, we published around 2.7 billion integers, counts, in the redistricting file, which we call the PL94171 file. Uh, after public law 94171 that specifies how redistricting data is provided to the states. <clears throat> the balance of that we put in what's called summary file one. So in total, we published around 
five billion integers. Now from high school math, you may remember that if you have more equations than you do unknowns, you can actually solve for the unknowns. And you can literally build a system with 5.5 billion equations and solve for the, the roughly 1.8 billion unknowns. And we've done that. That's called database reconstruction. So we performed that database reconstruction attack on our published data, the data that we published in 2010, using only public microdata, we were able to reconstruct all 3.308,745,538 uh, microdata records. We did that. We performed a database reconstruction and re-identification attack on all of the published data from the 2010 census. And we reconstructed 308,745,538 microdata records. And then those records have age, address, sex, and ethnicity, but they don't have name. So we then bought a commercial database in 2010 that had names, addresses, ages, and sex. And if you link the two databases together, you now have linkage between name and ethnicity and race. And that's considered by most Americans to be very confidential data. We also have linkage to ages of children, which also most Americans consider to be quite confidential. It's actually hard to buy information on children in the United States. Our linkage rate was about 45%. And the, we, we know the confidential data, so we actually then peaked and we saw how good we got it. And the re-identification rate was around 38% of the linked data, which means that for 17% of the US population, we could reconstruct the confidential data. So you shouldn't worry that your confidential data may be um, revealed by the Census Bureau. We didn't publish names in 2010. We're never going to publish those names. And we have prepared this public service announcement, which you can view later explaining how we're going to keep your data safe. But another thing we've done for 2020 is that we are modifying the privacy protection mechanism that we're using. <clears throat> now, to explain, to understand how we're, we're doing it, you need to drill down on how we actually publish data. What statistical agencies do is we take data from people, like here we have seven people on a block, and we tabulate that data different ways. We might publish the total number of people on the block, their median age, their mean age, maybe the number of females on the block, the number of males, number of people in each racial category. <clears throat> you can take those counts and those means and you can create a set of equations. And in this case, it comes to about 164 separate equations. So I did that on my MacBook Pro. My MacBook Pro can solve those equations in about 0.2 seconds and come up with the confidential data based solely on those published statistics. So the basic idea of differential privacy is to take the data that we would publish and add noise to it. So in this case, the, the count of that block might be nine people but we might publish eight people. And the, the median of age on that block might be 35 and we might publish 45. So adding noise protects the confidentiality of the respondents. Now what differential privacy does is it allows us to control the amount of noise that we add so that the statistics that we care about are modified the least and the statistics that we don't care about are modified the most. And there is a minute physics video that we worked with the creator of minute physics to do. And it's, it's more than a minute, but it's totally worth watching. We're not going to watch it now. Differential privacy allows us to control that privacy loss versus accuracy trade-off. It allows us to put the accuracy where we need it. And we say that it's future proof because no matter what breakthroughs there are in the future, the respondent data protected with differential privacy remains protected. <coughs> now the question is, how much noise should we add? 
So that's really a policy decision. And you can see on this graph that if we add a little bit of noise, um, we get highly accurate data. That's off on the right. We get highly accurate data, but there's a high privacy loss. And if we don't put a lot of noise in over on the left, um, that's less privacy loss, but the data is less accurate. So that's also more noise. So the way the top-down algorithm works is that we basically compute the statistics at each layer of the census. We compute statistics at the national layer, at the state layer, uh, at the county, for every track and for every block. We then add noise to each of those sets of statistics, and we end up with a set of noisy statistics for each different level. And then we use a commercial optimizer to make sure that all of those noisy statistics <clears throat> are consistent with each other. Now, there's no off-the-shelf system for applying differential privacy to a national census. So we had to create one. We had to create a system that would produce high quality statistics at densely populated geographies, like in cities and for the nation, and produce consistent tables. So we created this new algorithm that, as I said, it, <clears throat> it processes statistics top down. It starts at the national level. It then computes the statistics at the state level, at the county level, at truck, block group, and finally at the block level. <clears throat> and this system fits into the decennial production system. So the way the disclosure avoidance system works is that it takes what we call the census edited file. It then performs the differential privacy mechanism. We call that disclosure avoidance because we want to avoid an improper disclosure. And then it produces the microdata detail file from which the tabulations are made. Now here's a, a more uh, enlarged diagram of what we're doing. We actually take what's called the decennial response file. That's people's census returns. <clears throat> it's also the reports from enumerators who visit house to house. That goes into something called the census unedited file. Uh, it is then edited for correctness. For example, you might say, um, if you're filling out the census form for your household, you might say that your mother is 30 years old and your daughter is um, 95 years old. And so maybe they're both living with you and you swap them. So we might reverse those two ages. That's an example. Um, we then take that census edited file and we apply the global confidentiality protection process. We do the differential privacy. We make the microdata detail file and that microdata detail file is then what's used for the official tabulations. So, we actually don't work with microdata in the census system. We actually work with histograms of people who live on that block. And so to understand what that means is uh, this block, that our sample block, which had seven people on it, you can think of it as a histogram, which is largely sparse. It's a histogram with, uh, six dimen with five dimensions. One dimension is age, one dimension is sex, one dimension is race, one dimension is ethnicity, and one dimension is relationship to the householder. So it has about 500,000 cells, and most of those cells are zero, but seven of those cells have ones in them. We take that histogram and we apply differential privacy to that histogram, and then we have a noisy histogram, and from that we reconstruct the microdata that is the most consistent with that noisy histogram. And so we end up with different kinds of people, but there's a relationship. And if epsilon is high, we add a very small amount of noise. Uh, and if epsilon is low, we add a lot of noise. And if we add a very small amount of noise, then the histogram looks a lot like the input histogram. So our original mechanism, which I call the block by block mechanism, started with 8 million habitable blocks. It added noise to each histogram and it created 8 million protected blocks. Now, um, apparently this version of the histogram has about 217,000 cells. Uh, but if you look at that, we, uh, we start off with uh, 5.3 petabytes of, of zeros, uh, 1.7 gigabytes of data, but it's sparse. We run that through the disclosure avoidance system. And then we, we 
coalesce that into a new set of microdata. So we go from 1.7 gigabytes to 5.3 petabytes back to 1.7 gigabytes. And that's beginning to sound like something you would want to do with Spark, right? So here's actually a, a map of how we do that with Spark. We have a 16 gigabytes uh, comma separate values file. We create uh, an RDD with 8 million, 8 million um, scikit sparse histograms. We use a map operation to apply the noise. We then use the Barobi um, linear prog uh, prog uh, mixed integer linear program to solve all those histograms to be consistent. We then map it to create microdata and we save it as a text file. So we very clearly distinguish the part where the noise gets, the adding of noise, the microdata, uh, the, the protection process of differential privacy from the post-processing which is done with Garobi, and most of the work is going to be in the post-processing. So the problem with that mechanism is that every block ends up with a lot of noise, and when you add those blocks up to get counties and states, the noise gets added up too. So in 2018, we invented the top-down algorithm, which uh, actually first works on a national histogram, and then it works on the 51 state histograms, because we treat uh, the District of Columbia as a state for this process. We then work on the county histograms, on the census tract histograms, and eventually on the block level histograms. So each set of records is turned into a histogram. We add the noise, we get the noisy histograms. Um, we then uh, take those noisy histograms uh, at both the, the national level and the state level, and we make them consistent with Garobi. We then take the state level histograms and we make them consistent with the county level histograms, again using Garobi. And you can see that the histogram storage gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we go down. The first histogram only takes 869 kilobytes, the states take 44 megabytes, and then when we're at the block level, it's five terabytes. And uh, we actually need to store two histograms. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of data, right? And in terms of counts, um, we still, when we're done with this, we only want to have, um, you know, each of those histograms has uh, 217 integers in it. So it's a, a total of five terabytes. Uh, so those slides, I think, are out of order. So, so all this is going on, and you might get the idea that our, our RDDs are not very well balanced at all, because we have one RDD for the national level, and it's like a megabyte, and we have one RDD at the block level, and it's like, you know, five terabytes. Uh, we have another design, but we haven't moved to it yet because this design works and we don't have a lot of time left. So the top-down algorithm is not balanced. Most of our computation is done in Garobi. So we call Garobi as a shared library in that mapper. Uh, so that's even invisible to, to Spark. It's, the, it's like this big Python process going on. And we typically have to pr perform uh, around 800,000 separate optimizations for a typical run. Uh, we're looking at other algorithms where we'll actually need to do around 3 million optimizations per run. Garobi is a multi-threaded shared library. So we can tell Garobi, you know, Python thinks it only has one uh, thread and Spark is giving four threads per each executor, but you can go use 90 threads because we're running on the machine with 96 cores and it's very unlikely that all those cores are going to be used at any given time. We're running in the AWS GovCloud. And it turned out that the AWS monitoring tools like CloudWatch were just too coarse. Uh, they weren't recording data fast enough. They were throwing the data away after when we wanted to look at it. And those, the data that they were collecting wasn't really synced up with, with our runs. So we ended up developing our own monitoring system specifically for this application. Now, we're only going to run the top-down algorithm once in 2021. Um, because we're still collecting the data now in 2020. But to develop and tune this algorithm, we have to run thousands of trials, thousands of tests. So we also need to have a system for keeping track of all those runs. And so we could see how our algorithm got better. <clears throat> so to do that, we built a separate monitoring framework. We have an agent that runs on every node, on the master nodes and on the worker nodes. They send data separately to a REST server. That REST server stores data, that's an Apache server using the REST protocol. Uh, that stores data in a MySQL database for using the Amazon RDS service. And we store the results uh, 
and, and we have a web-based display. So here's an example of our cluster list. Um, we typically have anywhere between three and 10 separate EMR clusters running at a time. Um, the clusters are, we bring them up and we bring them down all the time. So the Amazon cluster list, identi the cluster identifier is difficult to work with. So the clusters, when they start up, they, they pick randomly chosen names for themselves. So this one, the first cluster picked the name ABAT, A-B-D-A-T, and the second one picked the name B-R-I-O-S. Um, uh, each one has uh, a diff potentially a different version of EMR running, and then we have our own release system. And you can see that the ABAT has eight workers right now with a total of six gig of RAM, excuse me, um, uh, six, um, yeah, six gigabytes of RAM. Um, and the, the second one uh, has six workers, but it only has 4.6 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, the first one has 768 virtual CPUs, excuse me, not gigabytes, terabytes, uh, that's running on uh, machines that have uh, 768 gigabytes of RAM. And, and so, sorry about that. Terabytes of RAM, not gigabytes of RAM. Um, anyway, we, we, we track the CPU load on each machine uh, with these little graphs. And if you click the show button, uh, it would actually show you each of the workers so you can see how balanced it is. And, and here I do that with uh, the Brios cluster. So you can actually see graphically the, the CPU load on, on each machine and the memory load. Uh, we could create and kill the, the clusters for each separate run, but for various reasons, we decided not to do that. Uh, the clusters just take too long to start up. And, and you know, typically we'll have like a hundred of these machines running at a time and there's some capacity issues that we've run across in the past. So each run of the DAS we call a mission and um, uh, the mission names are randomly chosen with an adjective and a noun. So here we have a litigious welcome is the first mission <clears throat> and we have a waitlist unique is the second mission. Um, each of these missions um, uh, for like a test run, uh, we, we try to run small runs. So we actually have, we have small data sets or we might be trying to just work on one aspect of the algorithm. You can see there the fourth mission, uh, intravenous spread, it, it crashed. So it has an exit code of one and it only ran for 115 seconds. <clears throat> but the, the first one, litigious welcome, it ran for 72,000 seconds. And um, we track uh, the, the Garobi version, we track other information. We actually track about a hundred variables for each of these missions. Um, for just the mission itself, itself uh, the display itself, each mission uh, there, it can uh, go do logging. I'll, I'll go back to that previous slide. Um, uh, uh, there's a log statement. And so the missions can put logs locally, but they can also send log messages to the centralized console. So you can go to this website and see interleave the log files of all the missions or you can see just the log for the particular mission. And you can see that while they're executing and you can see that when they're finished. <clears throat> um, you can also click and see the entire log, yarn log from that mission, or you can see the, the yarn log for a particular node. Um, this graph here shows uh, for a, a different mission, the execution of the top-down algorithm. So all the way off on the left, that's when the noisy measurements are being computed. And then the first uh, blue-green bump, that's when the nation, the nation to nation state, is, uh, nation to nation solve is being done. And that can only be done on one machine, but it's using 96 cores. And so the load goes up to 100. Then we do the nation to state solve. That's the second green uh, bump there. And um, that bump is, again, it's using all 96 cores but it's not using any of the other nodes. Now you might say, well, why don't you just shut down the other nodes? Um, because uh, it looks like you spent four hours. Well, we could, but those other nodes are holding the noisy measurements right now. And so if we shut them down, we'd have to put them off in HDFS or something, and then we'd have to load it back. Um, and it's petabytes of data. So we keep it in RAM. Um, anyway, um, I guess here it's, it's like high terabytes of data, but we keep it in RAM. <clears throat> then we, we do each different solve, and then you can see that, that big noisy part in the middle, that's, um, that's when the, uh, I think that's the track to block group solve happening. 
And then the, the next big bump, that's the block group to block solve happening. And then there's a whole bunch of statistics being computed at the end. And that's not using a, a lot of stuff on the nodes, but the, the red, the red bus of uh, the red line, that's the master. You can see there's a lot of stuff that the master is orchestrating. And it keeps hitting all the other clusters, all the other workers. Uh, and then finally everything gets saved out. So you know, this is a run that that is uh, thousands of dollars in computer time. It's running on machines that are seven dollars an hour each, and I think we have uh, you know you could count, but some large number of nodes. Um, we track the free memory. Now we we used to run out of memory, and our machines kept crashing. But now we know why, and we stopped that from happening. But we still want to be able to track the free memory because if it gets down to, to zero, that would be really bad. And you can see the master node uh, only has about 200 gig of free memory and the worker nodes, um, they're okay. Um, we also track the HDFS usage, we track input and output, we track actually all the parameters. I'm just not gonna show you all those graphs. So in summary, um, in 2020, um, oh, so let me just say the reason we track those is that we're trying to make the algorithm more efficient at the same time, we're trying to make the algorithm better. So the word efficiency is double loaded. Um, the statisticians, the computer scientists, they like to think of uh, the efficiency, the statistical efficiency, how little noise gets into the statistics that we care about and keeping that noise in the statistics that we don't care about. And uh, the engineering team wants uh, the machines to be used as efficiently as possible. We would like to see the load on every machine at a constant 100, uh, they have 96 cores. It's okay if they go up to 600 loads. Um, that just means it's gonna take 10 times longer, but at least all the machines are running with a load of 600. We could increase the number of clusters and run that faster, but it would, the number of workers, but it would then take longer. Uh, it, it, sorry, it would then cost more. So in summary, the, the 2020 census will use differential privacy as its privacy protection mechanism. Differential privacy allows us to add carefully controlled, no, controlled noise to the statistical queries. Uh, most of the work is in the post-processing to make the microdata for legacy users. You might remember from that, that graph, uh, the noise was added all at the beginning and then it was all the other parts of the top-down algorithm. And we use Spark to distribute the load to a commercial optimizer. We use Yorobi. And we solve, in that one I, I showed you, uh, around 800,000 mixed integer linear programs. Uh, the new version of the top-down algorithm will probably solve around uh, 2.4 million uh, mixed integer linear programs, maybe more. Um, so with that, I, I want to thank you all. If you're interested in, in this more, you can uh, get the ACM communications article that we published on understanding database reconstruction. And that has that example with seven people worked out. There was this lovely article in the Wall Street Journal. And um, uh, there was an article in Science. And there's been a lot of other coverage about our move to differential privacy. If you want the actual details, you can actually get the source code, which we've put on GitHub. This is the first time ever that the Census Bureau has published source code for its disclosure mechanism. And um, we've also published our detailed design specification for the system. And there's a scientific paper describing the mechanism as well. If you want more background, uh, it's here. And um, uh, with that, uh, I, I guess I'm free to take questions. So thank you very much for watching.